Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 617, that's 617 of the Agostino Zynga show. I hope you are doing well wherever you may find this lovely podcast. I hope you're doing well. I'm back in the hot seat. It's been a while, hasn't it? It's been a while. Apologies for the MIA and non-updates and all that malarkey. You shall find out sooner rather than later while that is the case. But in an effort to make sure that I do not waste any time blabbering on this intro, we're going to just jump right into things. So as you're aware, looking at the clock and looking at the date, it is the end of October it's way past the end of October it's now towards the middle of November how quickly the month does go by but I have to do a little wrap up and conclusion about my time doing Sober October this year 2022 as per usual I do Sober October on the back of what those guys on the Jerogan podcast do mainly Burt Kreischer, Tom Segura and Irish Shafir. it's something I never really knew existed prior to them doing it I'm not too sure if it did exist or it was popular before they started doing it but it is an opportunity for myself being an addict of nightlife being an addict of going outside and dancing and partying and having sometimes too much of a good time to actually get things back to normal reset and actually have an opportunity to get my life into some level of balance and to make me understand the things I should be prioritizing on and the things I should not be prioritizing on and this year was probably um, the most welcome sober October I've had in a while because I think when I did it for the first few times they did it before which might have been like 2019 2018 I think might have been the first time they did it, it was the first time I did it um, on sober October I used to do a lot more outside of partying that would basically alleviate any of the partying I was doing so I was running a bunch I was working out a bunch I was reading a bunch I was learning languages like I was on my ting back then so when it went to partying I definitely did see partying or was going out or having a good time I saw that as like the release I spent my Monday to Friday toiling in the fields and then when it comes to Saturday or Friday evening I get my chance to hang out with the lads have a bit of a drink have a bit of a boogie and get a little bit crazy but as the years progress and primarily and I shouldn't do this because I'm not that kind of guy usually, but I have to attribute some blame, maybe 1% blame to the pandemic. As soon as those gyms closed and I had no reason or no um, excuse to go to one and I wasn't allowed to go outside, quote unquote, I really did accept it lock, stock and barrel. I think I probably was too accepting of it and maybe kind of, you know, fell into line too quickly. But when it comes to having the ability to not work out and not go outside, having the gym taken away from us and especially the ability to go outside, because if you remember in the early parts of the pandemic, loads of governments were telling their citizens, hey, you cannot go outside. You can't even meet your friends for a sandwich or grab a coffee. In my area where I'm at, there were police officers patrolling the streets and squad cars and stuff and stopping anybody that was loitering around the place. You had to be pretending you were jogging or have like a cup in your hand. Like it was crazy. That, that's what time so for whatever reason i decided to swallow that whole thing i never really challenged or questioned it i kind of played along like a good little boy and effectively they ended up hurting me because then when it came to working out again or when it came to indulging in all my vices i ended up doing it especially during that time when i was out of work and whatnot i wanted an ability to just black out and forget about my day forget about the fact that i was unemployed forget about the fact that my prospects didn't look too great and i just wanted to kind of you know not remember and basically not be present and what's the best way of doing that? What's the best way of dealing with an actual issue that you're, you know, trying to put off drinking and doing drugs, of course. So I did that and it kind of really did help me, especially during the pandemic. Luckily, I was able to kind of pull myself into some level of order before the Sober October thing started. So it wasn't like I was going into it super green. It wasn't like I was going into it from a really, really bad point. I had some level of, um, you know, well-behaved, stuff that I was doing prior to that so it didn't get too crazy but still it was a bit of a nutty time for me so the sober October came at a pretty decent time and for me the main objective was just to have a real solid focused time not drinking not doing any drugs and for me that was the main point I needed um, especially because I don't necessarily have dr drinks and drugs at home to like to hang out and do stuff in usually it's always like the back end of a party it's always like okay I've gone to a party I want to maybe extend the party when I go home I continue or it's a day before the party i want to get buzzed you know that kind of thing but it's not like a monday to friday thing it's just like a spur the moment thing or afterwards when i want to kind of continue on the afters so it kind of was making me a bit down the fact that i was letting myself get that way because i've never been that way in the first place i was able to pull myself out that that flipping you know 
horrible position I was in. And so October came at a great time, man. Um, I was probably being the most productive I've ever been, especially on this channel, or especially on my podcast. I'm sure some of you can attest. This is probably the most, especially October, that's probably the most pods I've ever done in my entire life, I think, in one calendar month. The most amount of clips I uploaded and, cl and clipped up and shared. The most streams I've ever done back to back. I've even did Patreon, which I never really update. And sorry about that to people on my Patreon, but I never get into updating that because I just you know i'm usually recovering and don't have enough time from things that i'm doing well i have enough time let me put that to one side i'm usually recovering from you know the other night's affairs so the fact that i was able to focus on the things i actually need to do like you know without any distractions i went to the gym basically every single day with exceptions of one or two days here maybe the sundays here and there i couldn't go but apart from that i was riding my bike all the time going to the gym like it was incredible i don't have any other bad words to say about it and i think for myself especially the fact that i party a lot and the fact that october usually the, the, a good time to rave as well um it's kind of a dead month but it's a good time especially with halloween happening this year and i guess halloween this year if i'm not mistaken was the first halloween we had i think overall in western side of europe where there was no restrictions so it felt like everybody was out even though i wasn't out and to be honest i felt no fomo I felt no amount of FOMO, zero. I didn't feel one ounce, one inch of FOMO. And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that I did a lot of work prior. Because you know, some people say when you do your news resolution, you're not meant to do it on the day. You're meant to kind of start in December, but it's pretty difficult when you're with your family and you're with your friends, you're drinking, you're, you're eating and stuff. It's hard to get that going. But they usually say you should start any of those things kind of before the date. So you shouldn't start on the 1st. You should kind of start maybe on the 27th of December. Get yourself kind of going so that when the first comes, around it's not such a big switch to kind of switch over and i think what's happened with me is that when halloween came because i already started my sub october my sub october journey from like the back end of what was it september already i had I already kind of you know knocked off the, the drugs and the alcohol already on the head between the middle of september all the way until until the end of october with no flipping you know cheating or anything it made it easy when Halloween came around even though there were so many great parties this year I felt like this year was maybe the best time to go to a Halloween party in a very very long time because I feel like the UK we don't really do good Halloween parties people don't really like getting dressed up because we're quite you know we don't really like fun and games I feel like in the UK there is a lot of art and crafty sort of like base about us in terms of people but i feel like when it comes to parties and getting dressed up and going and doing the act doing the most or being extra or going the extra mile people just don't want to do it for whatever reason um there's pl plenty of ha halloween parties i've been to where there's been a big majority or there's been a, a large enough group of people in that rave who haven't got any outfits or no makeup on so it doesn't make you feel awkward if you are in there with no outfit so that's a bit of a strange one um but anyway, that aside, I uh, I felt like this year was different because I felt like even though people w weren't going super crazy with the, with the costumes and stuff, I feel like still there was a lot of events on and it kind of covered every level from like the proper bougie ones that you would see in Soho to like a warehouse party somewhere in the middle of Flippin' Hackney Wick. So the fact that I didn't get FOMO says a lot about where my mind was at that time. I was fully sober October, locked in. I wasn't really thinking about that. And also I knew at the end of sober October I was going to go crazy, which I obviously did. So <laughs> let's not let's not beat around that, which I actually did. But the benefits of sober October are, are that what you realise is how much time you're wasting. And that's something I have been repeating ad nauseum on here. You realise how much time you waste. And I've said it myself a lot to myself whenever I catch myself saying things like I don't have time because you always have time I, I'm a believer that there's always time to do the things that you want to do if you don't have time it's because it's not a priority and it's a bit of a brutal pill to take especially if it's a creative because you always think that oh if I get if I have my own thing if I'm freelancing I do this and I've got my time no you won't have any time you have to make the time even when you don't have it and then once you do have the extra time you'll realize that the habits that you built when you didn't have quote unquote time are going to sustain you when there's distractions all that kind of stuff come along the way and that's something i realized i realized that i have way more time in the day than i thought i did um i realized also if i just stick to doing something and doubling down i could knock them out like bang 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 
Um, and I also realized that I don't necessarily need alcohol and drugs to have a good time or clubs in general and that's a very very big um eye opener for me because as many of you know you know i'm i'm really into the whole techno tourism thing i love to discover new places far-flung places to go and club and party and have a good time discover new djs discover new scenes and whatnot i'm really in in that it's kind of part of my life in general i don't really you know fuck around when it comes to that sort of stuff and i wouldn't say it was a part of my identity but it's slowly and surely getting there especially when i keep repeating that sort of stuff in interviews but overall i feel like this has shown me that i don't need anything and i think that's a major thing in life that i've always kind of been i don't want to be the person that kind of has to have something in order to function i never want to be dependent on anything so it's good to know that if i do want to have a good time i can just be at home because it wasn't like i was at home raving to streams i, I might i might listen to a couple of ones in the gym but it wasn't like replacing going out with like watching people rave in places i just didn't care i just kind of kept myself on social as well as a big thing i was reading once a day that was a big thing um and i was just kind of looking myself in in terms of doing content and things i actually wanted to do in terms of watching films all that good stuff but apart from all the other distractions i kind of locked them out and it was really beneficial and again it really realized i have way more time in the day than i actually think i do so if sober october ever comes back around and um for you if you're still around here <laughs> to see it <laughs> morbid i know but you know what i mean but if there is ever an opportunity to do something like that then i do encourage you to do it especially sober october because i feel like it's more challenging than dry january i feel like a dry january after christmas after all that debauchery after all that gluttony after all that excess it's pretty easy to say you know what i don't want to i want to turn it off for a month right it's pretty easy in my opinion i think so obviously you know when i remember being at workplaces and people struggling with so with, even so with fucking dry january right but you shouldn't really be struggling with dry january dry january should be the easiest one to do but the hardest one i think the one that should be something people should try to do especially if you're an adult who kind of you know your life maybe revolves around going to the bars and meet your friends or to eat restaurants and whatever and you want to kind of abstain from maybe drinking too much red wine or whatever your vice is or smoking a cigar or weed whatever it may be I think a big one is sober October because weirdly enough around that time it feels like from like August to like November there's always somebody's flipping birthday every other week um there's always some sort of gathering and event to go to so it's quite handy if you do want to show, actually, if you want to test yourself and really want to see if how dependent you are um or how much of an addict you are is to kind of check test yourself during sober October it's a pretty brutal one it's not gonna be easy i drink like i said there's a lot of things i missed out on that i didn't have a chance to get to go to and you're gonna realize it when you're there it's not gonna be super fun especially if you decide to go to clubs and stuff i didn't i think the only proper club i went to was one event that uh you know i kind of pre-booked before and i didn't want to let my friend down and not go but the only thing that i went to i think was the print works at dixon thing after everything apart from that i kind of knocked off the head i didn't want to go raving sober anyway but still i wanted to kind of abstain completely but if you do decide to go out you will realize how you know um non-fun it is to go out sober especially if it's your first time you're gonna not like it but it is a good test in terms of realizing what um whether or not this party lifestyle thing has a real grip on you or whether or not it's something that you just do for fun and i realized when i was you know going through sober october that as much as i enjoy going out and getting messed up i think my primary reasons why i was going out was definitely to escape whatever hell hole i was going through personally when i was growing up and stuff or work whatever home life i'm pretty sure when i first was doing it but now as i kind of grew up and evolved and started to get into promoting started to dj myself started to go do the whole techno tourism thing i think over time i developed a deep love for it which then kind of you know turned into a passion or lifestyle thing whatever you want to call it so it's not necessarily a thing where we're going out with the sole intention of let's rack up the lines you know i mean i'm going out obviously to go and see people play i'm going out to meet people i'm going out to socialize to see venues and the architecture of things and soak in the atmosphere and all that kind of good stuff so it's good to know that if i would have found out on the other end that i was an addict i also would have been good to know because it's nice to know where you're at so you can no way you can kind of go and make necessary changes but sober october for me was an absolute blast and i re highly highly recommend it for those of you who haven't done it before then of course to break my sober october to break my sober october and to welcome me back to the life of um uh the life of excess the life of debauchery of course had to be fabric of course and i decided to go to continuum and blueprint records right and i have to be honest and say that <laughs> number one 
it was an absolute nightmare to get into like let's just put that out there and i've said it before previously when it comes to fabric like i like many people in london or for many ravers i'd say we probably all have a love-hate relationship with fabric um just because it's like such an institution here in london or in the uk overall but just the the infra the kind of infrastructure yeah maybe infrastructure is the right word whatever it is the operational side around it is such a hassle to deal with and you're a punter it really 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 is and from what i've heard it's no easier if you're a vip you know you have to go in through some other door with next to a chicken shop and stuff it's not it's not the easiest thing so i went to go to a continuum blueprint records and event now for me i was already on a bit of a i was a bit on a i was a bit on the how do you say it? I was a bit of a disadvantage when it came to this rave because I was working during the weekend. So I couldn't go throughout the entire event. I couldn't do the whole going there, coming back, sleeping and going out again. I had to kind of just pick my fights and go into a certain time in the morning and come back home, sleep and then go work in the morning. No big deal. I didn't have to go work as a work from home, but you know what I mean? So I couldn't stay too long and I couldn't do too much, but still it didn't matter. I went anyway. And I have to be honest, right? The fabric thing itself is such a hassle in the hellhole to deal with that I can understand why people just don't give it a chance based on just the first experience of going in there. So number one, you rock up there. And I think in general, the location for me, I think is great. I feel like it's like legitimately feels like the center of London in a way, which is not really. But in terms of transport links, in terms of yeah taxis and cabs and, and ubers and stuff it's probably the best distance you want to get to places you want to get home so you can basically get because I've, I've done it before sometimes i've gotten a bus maybe further up and then taken a cab there and then gone home or i've taken if i'm just completely tired i'm like you know i'll take the hit i'll just take the cab all the way home but I was, or i've obviously cycled home as well on that route so it's pretty easy so it's a pretty decent place to get to and from so no hassles that regard but the issues start as soon as you rock up to the club you walk up to the club and you know there's a flipping barriers all around it and the entry system that they have is that you have to go kind of a bit further down past the door you queue up and then you kind of get screened for your ticket first of all just to make sure you got a ticket so you get screened for your ticket then you get a ticket you go through then when you go through you get screened for an id for somebody else and then they put your your id into that machine that we have in most london clubs that machine that's flipping super uh, uh, big brother-esque right it feels incredibly like 1984 flipping george Orwell oh, oh, well, stuff where you basically scan your id card in it and the whole uh, premise behind it is that it's meant to put your details on some sort of database where that database is who knows what they do with it who knows but it essentially it's meant to be like a harm prevention thing where they can share details amongst each other of other clubs in the network i don't know if they have to be local if they have to be regional I'd, who knows and then they're meant to be aware of, hey, if this guy's a creep, hey, if this guy's you know, violent, if this guy's been banned, if whatever it may be, they can put those things on or maybe put other notes on there, whatever it may be. But obviously this doesn't happen most of the time because these guys, you know, they've got a million more people they have to deal with. I'm not sure if they're going to be sitting there adding notes into your box about whether or not you harass somebody at the bar, whether or not you bump somebody in a queue, who knows. So you do all that stuff and then you go into another queue where you're basically met by a two seat then you go as, then as you do that you go into into the club and you're met by two people on either side no before you do it actually so forget that before you do that you, you give a person to scan the thing and then before you walk in someone scans you with a metal detector handheld one and proper up everywhere obviously if you look like me you get scanned some more because they never know if you're on flipping you know chup 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 time so you get scanned super hard and then then you go in and then you have like two rows of people with buckets next to them and then they say to you to open all your pockets and maybe even that if you're if you're unlucky like i was you get scanned again at that station so the station where you basically put all your positions in a bucket and then you spread yourself out like that and have the person you know search everywhere and when i say search everywhere i mean search everywhere you know you're under your armpits like i i, I even had i even had the feeling that the person was searching you know that the, your belt loop bit or whatever that that position is called next to the belt that was being searched the inside of my thing was being searched the, then they used the back of their hand and searched on the inside between my legs where usually most people would stash their gear right all that kind of area it gets searched so trust me if you go to fabric just behave be your best behavior don't muck around because if they find anything on you i'm not sure what they might do to you they might put you in a flipping you know in a dust choke or something but you get searched extensively and then again and then i got another scan again and luckily again 
luckily me now I'm going to clubs a lot and I've you know I've been doing this for a while and it's not something that I go to just for the sense of escapism and to go and you know get high go crazy because of that I don't necessarily go drunk and high anymore I generally maybe go in with a bit of a buzz maybe at most a bit of a flipping buzz from a magnum or something but for the most part I'm going there stone cold sober and ready to go get lit inside so luckily it doesn't affect me these things but I'd imagine if I was high off whatever and I was getting scanned and searched and groped and touched to this extent. It's the ultimate vibe killer. Ultimate vibe killer. Which is why I understand why people don't even give that place a chance. Even though the lineup is so sick. right? The lineups in Fabric every weekend, bar none, are always incredible. And nowadays even more so because they've, I felt like, opened their doors up to like more alternative quote-unquote club nights. Right? Um, some of the guys and girls involved in the LGBTQ and queer scene, some of the sex positive parties, some take place in there. So they're clearly trying to open up their horizons, you know, um, try to welcome in different people. And the fact of the matter is, if once you go there once and you hear the sound system and you hear and you see how nice the club is in terms of to get around and how it's laid out and stuff, it's hard not to go back there again. Like I've I've been there many many times over the years, and I even I have my reservations about it. I still go back because it's still legitimately on the eye and to the ear one of the best nightclubs in the world but it's just the hassle before you get in there so that finishes you put your thing in a bowl then you have to walk up some stairs to then go to the ticket office right and then the ticket office you go up and another thing that i really hate which is a, it's a pet peeve but i know there's probably good reason for it but it's the over it's the overbearing nature of the people who try to usher you along. Maybe there are ushers in terms of like, stand on that side, you're, to, you're, next, you're next. It's like, we know, we're in the queue. We can see, especially in Fabric, they've got these little, you know, they've got these little uh, ticket offices things with these perspex glasses. We're sorry, with perspex glass where the ticket attendants stand, sit in a position so they either scan your ticket or you pay for a ticket. But we can see, we know, we're standing in a queue, we see them right in front of us. But there's always somebody shouting, come on, move in front, go up, stop waiting, and you're next. It's just, I hate that stuff. It gets grinds my, grinds, my, grinds my gears. And like I said, imagine if I was high or drunk, I'd be super tense, right? So you do that, you get a ticket scanned, and then when you're finished there, you want to put your coat in a flipping coat room like I did because I had a big, massive parka that I was wearing, right? You want to put that thing in there. Guess what? You have to queue up again and then go to put your cloak, your key in the cloak, sorry, your coat in the cloakroom. So I didn't want to wait. And obviously I was with somebody else as well who didn't want to wait. And I thought, you know what? Let's just go in. Go inside, but I've got this big jacket in my hand. So now I decided to, so now I'm in a position where I have to be resourceful and find out how I'm going to maneuver this nightclub where it's incredibly hot. It's in a basement. The air conditioning is essentially non-existent raving and dancing the way that i do which is excessive and really aggressive right i kind of get with it right? i'm cramping in that dance floor i'm going for i'm being aggressive um i'm treating it like i'm in some sort of hardcore show you know i mean swinging arms and elbows everywhere so now i have been in a position where i'm having to start into beg for in these little security guards of the green room to let them let me in so i can dash my coat in the back which they were graceful enough to do they shouldn't probably done it and I probably wasn't a wrong for even asking and they're probably, I hope they don't get in trouble for letting me in there, but I ended up having to dash my coat in the green room so I could have an opportunity to just enjoy myself because I didn't want to go there, pay all that money that I paid to go for a ticket just to go and hold my jacket the whole time because the queue was too long. And they want to keep going up and down and checking either. So that's annoying. So then I put my thing in there and then, then it starts. The actual event starts and it was heavenly. And also big up to Fabric too, credit to them because they never usually do this. I don't know why they did this this time, but for some reason, they decided to put the flipping lineup on social, and they never did this before. So they never have the set list of who's playing. Maybe because it was a continuum event in terms of going you know, from Saturday to Sunday. But either way, I super appreciate it. And the fact that we had the lineup beforehand alleviate my fears before going there in terms of who I wanted to see, in case I was going to miss anybody. That was flipping brilliant. And the rave itself, I have no complaints. I think when I arrived, um, I got to see the end of Theo Nash play I think I'll oh, say Theo Nasser wasn't necessarily for me and then I got obviously to see the main people I wanted to see was Dave Clark and um, Renee Wise number one point to make about Dave Clark can we just say Dave Clark he's a very opinionated person somebody who you know doesn't uh, 
shirk an opportunity to share his thoughts on topics concerning DJ culture and stuff. And you can obviously see some some articles here for courtesy of Google News. Dave Clark, the scene is linked to money, not ethics. Another headline here from Dave Clark says, Dave Clark speaks out against DJs playing during the COVID-19 pandemic. Another one here where he says, Dave Clark speaks about pandemic parties, like clearly, right? In, uh, uh, greedy business ethics above all so somebody has got like a strong opinion when it comes to that sort of stuff and i don't know why it is but i guess in my head maybe because i've been asking myself that question the fact that i'm i would consider myself or people would class me in a role as a cultural commentator and but i also like to dj and i also would like to be in a position where i'm playing at some of these big clubs and festivals and parties and stuff i was asking myself this question recently like can you be both critic and artist or can you be artist and a critic at the same time and it's difficult to find it because you would imagine if you keep criticizing enough you might end up upsetting people who are in a position to put you in position so naturally people would kind of you know keep their thoughts and opinions themselves because they don't want it to affect their actual you know um their actual uh, artistry that they do day to day things that they want to do as a kind of job so i understand people kind of hold hold off on it and also the other side of things, I feel like if you're somebody that's very opinionated when it comes to culture, but you also partake in terms of being an artist or a performer or whatever, you create things in terms of content. I always feel like sometimes the most opinionated ones usually are the ones who don't create the best work. You're focusing way too much time on what people are doing wrong and not focusing enough time on what you should be doing. And I feel that maybe a, a bit of my head, a part of my head probably thought that same thing about Dave Clark. But one thing I can say for certain, one thing I can say for sure Dave Clark is not a shit DJ. He's very, very good at DJing. Surprisingly so. Number one, when he set up into the booth after the Theo Nasser guy played, who I wasn't necessarily a fan of, he, number one, is a lot taller than he looks like on the internet. So it probably might explain why he carries himself a certain way on the internet. Like, you know, no one can talk to him, no one can chat to him, kind of vibe, you know. And then number two, he's really good at DJing, like incredibly good. And from what I could hear, from what I can remember, it was mostly, I felt like, acid cuts um, that he was doing some weird effects things with on a mixer. I'm assuming maybe it was something to do with the filters, something to do with the channels. Um, but the way he was mixing, the mechanical nature of it, he was. it kind of reminded me a little bit of DVS1 in terms of his style, playing behind the decks. Um, yeah, it was a lot more action-packed, a lot more... Um, there's a lot more range to it. He completely turned the dance floor up when he started performing. People started going crazy. You could tell the difference in levels when he started performing. Even though the dance floor was full when Fionnassa was playing, when Dave Clark came on, he just went a completely another level. I was near the front for the first 10, 20 minutes. And as it is in clubs, when you're not concentrating and not focusing and you're just dancing, having a good time, you don't realise how many people are coming and just like coming in front of you. And by the time I realised where I was, I was near the back again. So it's like I kind of got pushed without realising I was getting pushed. And people were going nuts. So people on the platform, on the left of me, to the right of me. This is room two, by the way. Room two is the best room for me. It's the best room. It's obviously the newest room in terms of update, in terms of what they've done with the lighting and the sound. But it's really the best room. You've got this weird kind of DJ booth that's behind this. I think it's like a concrete block, it feels like. But they've got this back bit where people can... It feels like the DJs are sort of like in um in a Colosseum. That's what it feels like. They're like here, and then we're all here. There's a platform there that's above them. There's a bit behind them that's above them also. Like we're all kind of looking down them and they're just like smashing out the tunes. Oh, it's one of the best, I feel like in my opinion, one of the flipping best. So that happened. That was a good time. Um, Dave Clark absolutely smashed it to pieces. And then obviously my guy, Rene Wise, came on towards the end. And I absolutely loved that. I think I said it for the, for the two hours that he was on. I didn't stay for the full set. But that was absolutely banging. I had to convince some people in the crowd that he was good. Because I think when he started, a lot of people were like, oh, he's not Dave Clark. He's not the same level. I was like, no, trust me. Give this guy a chance. He, this kid's the future. He is the one. He is, he is the one. And then a few of them came back around and said, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, we like the guy. He was flicking good. But obviously, a lot of them saying, oh, he's not as good as Dave Clark. I was like, come on, man. He's not as old as Dave Clark as well. I mean, this kid is young. Like, give him some time to get used to and get, get his feet under the table. But honestly, continuing Blueprint Records, absolutely banging of a night. Like I said, I didn't get to see many more people because I had to leave because I had work in the morning. But absolutely amazing for who i did see in terms of dave clark and renee wise and i would recommend going in general but just be aware of the of the kind of hassle you have to kind of put up with when you're there with or to kind of get inside the club in the first place i feel like once you're in there like i said it's one of the best clubs in the world but you have to kind of get in there first and you have to hope that you don't get vibe killed because all that stuff is just annoying for me like it's just 
oh yeah yeah the searching is just so excessive so so much but i just i'm sure it comes from a good place i'm sure there's, there's reasons behind it you know this club nearly closed a million times due to antisocial behavior due to you know other things going on inside that we don't need to mention and the fact that they're still around says everything about them the fact that they take it seriously they do and the fact also let's give them credit that they're pivoting you know they're an institution that could be stuck in their own ways and just booking flipping clones of ricardo villalobos playing every single day craig was just playing every single weekend they could just do the same or same one and it would still probably do pretty well because they got a crowd and they've got a community of people that love that space regardless but the fact that they're trying to reinvent themselves without selling out what they actually are about is not selling out but without kind of you know removing themselves from what made them who they are is really admirable and i feel like doesn't get enough credit because a lot of places wouldn't probably do that so big up to them even though maybe it's the market dictating it whoever um it's just the, the the hassle of getting in is just too much it's just too much it really is too much um so you really have to love who you're going to see you know to kind of put up with all that but i did i enjoyed it room two was smashing i didn't really see anyone in room one didn't really care for the most part and bigger fabric also for putting out the set list beforehand because that was really really welcomed then i want to make a quick note and say unfortunately at the end or oh, i went out actually obviously had a good time but I decided when I go out, oh, actually, I had, yeah, I had a great time. Actually, almost had a good time. I had a great time. And it was obviously, um, you know, wet and cold. Oh, my God, it was so wet on the way back. It was raining torrentially, like, literally, like, it was, it felt like I was in Southeast Asia or something. It was horrendous. And I decided this time around, hey, it's wet, it's cold. I have to bust out my parka. And I remember, oh, yeah, I got my rave parka that I've been wearing for years, right? And it's my flipping Vetma parka from where is it from fall 2016 not sure if you guys remember but this is the parka that i have right i've been wearing for years you can see there the badges on there you see that there you go yeah somewhere around there anyway you can see the picture but i've been wearing this bad boy for bloody years and it's usually my go-to jacket whenever it comes around to flipping um whenever it comes down to uh to winter season but I didn't notice all this time that I've had it that it's absolutely dying so on its last leg so I need to get a replacement or get another one maybe I'm probably going to get this because this jacket if I'm not mistaken from 2017 is based on a Canada goose so it's their flip of a Canada goose and then the funny thing is is that the following season actually um which might have been yeah it was probably was spring 2017 um vetmon did a whole entire collection full of collaborations and i think one of them was a collaboration with canada goose which is what that iconic red one is which i might get i think it's a red one that is in a kendrick lamar video um it's the one that kind of like clips and it makes it you can make it short and it comes in black as well and um but yeah but this one is based on an original canada goose um, and i've been wearing it for flipping donkey years and it's one of my flipping favorite jackets that I have that I own. But unfortunately, it's dying. So I'm going to have to kind of bin it. And it's my last flipping go around of going out in the clubs with it. But it's legitimately, this jacket has taken me to, this jacket has gone to me with, yeah, it's gone to, it's gone with me to Frankfurt. It's gone with me to Berlin. Like, it's probably going to go with me to Kiev if the war didn't break out because I was going to go there for my next kind of techno tourism trip. It's been around the world with me. And unfortunately, now it's on its last legs and I'm having to, you know, bin it for lack of a better term and i'm really upset i'm not going to lie i'm kind of upset i just kind of have to go but noticing all the flipping you know rips on it and stuff it's got to be going but yeah i realize now especially going out like you know the the flipping winter seasons has arrived you need to have a parker on there i need to kind of replace it so unfortunately that jacket has gone and i think i've actually got a picture of it here actually from 2017 this is actually the collection up on flipping vogue so you can see which jacket i have in case you can't see the full image this is yeah 2016 full vetmar this is kind of again during the era where i was obsessed with flipping them now still am but when vetmar first came into my life especially with someone like myself who wasn't necessarily that crewed up on maison margella i've seen these shapes and seeing where all these references were coming from because i had some knowledge of maison martin margella and what legacy and what influence he had on fashion but in terms of seeing how he's how demo was able to take that learnings or take that kind of inspiration and kind of update it in his way it really gave me a new family appreciation of maison martin margella i'm not sure if some people are the same some people i'm sure just bought vetema and didn't care about margella but for me it kind of made me understand why margella was such a big deal that this fashion designer this talented guy in demna was willing to go into the archives and dig this deep and reference them so much 
much because I felt like early Vetmo was basically just a tribute act to like the glory days of flipping Margiela and when maybe he felt he was really in love with fashion and the industry in general and maybe now it's changed blah 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 but I thought the early parts of Vetmo were absolutely incredible so this is it and I think the look for it if you want to see it yourself in the fall 2016 Vetmo is look number where the things was the end where is it towards the end I guess look number 50 in Vetmar for 2016. There's some absolute bangers here that still stand the test of time, right? There's this fire may burn, was it, oh, sorry, may the bridges burn or something all the way. Um, hoodie, I think that purple hoodie that's got something about sex is on here as well. Yeah, this one, yeah, sexual fantasies. That hoodie's on, that hoodie is part of that collection. This bomber jacket that I've always wanted to with total fucking darkness in the back and the, and the pentagram is in that collection also. There's this Justin Forever um, hoodie with a long sleeve underneath it. I feel like a sweatshirt hoodie. I'm not sure, sure actually material. Maybe it's just a long sleeve. Clara 3000, I think they're modeling back in the day when they used to have loads of it scene kids and artists. Man, now it's mostly just models. I don't feel like they, they do too much of the scenesters anymore. Or maybe I just don't know them, not too clued up. But this is a strong collection. But the jacket that I have is here, look number 50 so you can see what i'm playing with but unfortunately i'm having to hang mine up because it's absolutely battered and bruised but this is the jacket i have here absolutely love it and like i said it's, it was funny because the very next season they had a full collection full of flipping collaborations that they did and put out but you know you gotta love a vetmar or demo design parker always oversized always boxy always loads of big pockets and i love the fact that the hood also has got this weird extension bit here i think obviously because maybe you can see it here on the hood kind of extends so obviously you've got the logo and it kind of extends out so you can kind of hide completely underneath the hood which is pretty sick but like i said i'm gonna have to chuck mine away and replace it with an absolute banger when i absolutely get the time to do so actually let me see if i can get up on the screen and show you the one i'm gonna replace it with but it's the one that was featured in a kendrick lamar video a very long time ago i think it was 2017 it should be 2017 um spring summer collection with those loads of collaborations they had like one with like i think carhartt as well including a collaboration in there loads of other pieces, bits and pieces but it's one of my favorite jackets actually and it's always kind of props up here and there on gray or sometimes and some other um consignment type store places that you can pick up some vetimar on some lady maybe purchased it thinking she wanted to be cool and then kind of fell out of love because this this early vetimar was not the most flattering stuff ever. Do you know what I mean? It was very, very boxy, very big, very long. Um, this is when he was really in these artistry kind of bag, not really trying to sell things, just trying to make cool shit. Um, so a lot of it is not the most flattering stuff to wear if you're a chic um, lady out there. Do you know what I mean? Nowadays, I think Balenciaga probably fits a lot better in terms of that kind of mold, but still has that kind of edge in it. But yeah, this is from for 2017 actually and you can see the upgrade i think this also includes a collection where they had that um swing jacket that everyone still um jocks the one that i still actually want the classic or the famous swing jacket i think it's that one there yeah the, the, the Levi Levi swing jacket which is essentially um a denim jacket that looks like it's been spliced um through the middle and then restitched again to make it cinched but from what i remember on the inside i think it's only sp sliced on the waist around the front but not all the way around the back so then they stitched it kind of like a dark design so it kind of flares out at the back when you're wearing it which is quite nice and it's also cropped in terms of its fit but as you can see in this collaboration this is a this is a collection full of collaborations i'm pretty sure there's one here i'm pretty sure with dickies or car with a double knee stuff there's a levi's collaboration there's a few other i think there might be champion in here there's reebok in here also um and then the Parker that I want to replace the one that I had already. There's yeah, there's a famous obviously that Antwerp champion hoodie that everyone's rocking, and then another one as well there. Um, and the one that I want is this. This is the one, and it comes in black and red. So it's look number fifty-two and fifty-four, spring, twenty seventeen. Better more. You've got this black jacket and a red jacket that comes in. Yeah, it comes in black and red. Sorry, and the inside of it, um, it's actually a Canada Goose collaboration. So I'm not sure what model it is, but whatever model it is, there's a harness or strap on the inside so you can wear it like a backpack. I'm sure that's maybe a vet mom thing to do. And there's also a harness on the inside so you can tuck the ends of it in and not have it super long, which is pretty cool. So it comes in black and red also. So you've got it wearing like a backpack there. And obviously they've got it wearing like a classic jacket. So those are the ones I'm probably going to end up replacing them with. So interesting to end the show like that, isn't it, right? Them was in his bag them days, isn't it? He ended the show with in between that. So you got two looks with the 
looks like a velvet or velvet or something crushed velvet or suede or something um suit head to toe you've got this motorbike um outfit also with the connected trousers and jacket with a nice sweater with a heart on it or maybe some long sleeve shirt and then you've got a parka but in general no real big ball gowns or whatever some there's a dress here but most of it's kind of like what you'd term to be classic streetwear with a parka and whatnot and a tracksuit and some leather and some boots and whatnot it's a clever way interesting way to kind of end the show but yeah i love that jacket and i'm really upset that i'm having to throw mine away but the time has come the time has come moving on from that we want to talk about this quickly so this is a little clip that i seen online courtesy of a dj here in the uk called elijah who is most of you might know from elijah and skillam days um i know him loosely because he knows some of my friends um but i think at the time that we were kind of all hanging out i wasn't necessarily the one trying to go out and make new friends and stuff so i didn't really go and you know try to become friendly or whatnot but from what i remember him in the scene and stuff he's always been a pretty decent cool guy pretty level-headed pretty chill and it looks like he's evolving into this other part of his life where instead of just being you know a guy that makes great tunes a guy that djs a guy that's an artist in his own right he's also deciding to be a bit of an advocate a bit of a speaker a bit of a commentator um in terms of anything concerning dance music electronic music djing in general and obviously he's got loads of experience that he can obviously impart and give to people and i feel like this clip that i'm about to play Curtis of his Twitter page was really telling and really for me was a sign that I think a lot of people have basically kind of been repeating but said definitely a sign or an indication or a pointer for me in terms of where I want to take my DJing because you know I'm in this weird place like I mentioned prior where I was playing quite often even though it wasn't you know I wasn't playing in flipping Burkhan every weekend I was playing in local bars and pubs here you know where I live and whatever it may be but I was getting opportunity to play every single weekend pre-pandemic right from like Friday to Sunday sometimes even sometimes Thursday to Sunday I was playing every single weekend without fail and it was great because even though I wasn't playing in great amazing places I got the ability to play in front of an audience every single weekend which I feel like improved my ability to DJ improved my ability to read a crowd improved my ability to you know read a room to take people on a journey whatever you want to call it that actual stuff of being in front of people and playing is different from doing in your bedroom you can obviously be good and be at a certain level in your room but it's clearly in a performative act in some way shape or form and have the ability to perform in front of people especially if you want to go in that direction is really important and i got the ability to do that but then as soon as the pandemic hit that obviously went away and even at the time though i knew it was kind of perilous because i always thought to myself hey as great as i think i am I'm also understanding that these kind of places don't really need DJs. If they had somebody in there who could, especially if they had a bartender, that'd be even better because they don't need to pay that person, right? They could just have somebody who already works there basically doing it. But I was, I was, I remember a couple of times thinking to myself, like, this is daylight robbery that they're paying me 150 quid or whatever to pay in these places because they could effectively get somebody like myself or anybody else who's kind of has a love for music and who could just kind of every week or every couple of weeks just update their playlist, add some more songs on it, change around the order here or there and basically play, put together a playlist which is very easy to do for the entirety of the day that they're out because if, if you imagine in a bar there's no mixing the whole tune to play all the way through and t unless the bartenders don't like a particular one they can skip it but for the most part you're playing the entire tunes all the way through so if you need or if you're kind of you know, if you're about this life you can put together a pretty decent pub set with your eyes closed in terms of kind of from the time that they open up from often the time people start coming in and wanting to dance every around 9 p.m all the way until one or two you could easily put that together even 12 it's not hard so i thought to myself oh, as soon as this pandemic hits and these guys realize that they don't need us because they're going to be putting playlists on because they don't they can't hire djs to come and play because there's no dancing or anything it's going to change and it did and as soon as the pandemic happened i feel like all my gears kind of dried up maybe because of that and also maybe because they might have thought i was crap anyway and it's an excuse to get rid of me who knows but in general that's been the thing that's kind of been affected my ability to maybe go out and play or do mixes and stuff or put them up or whatever maybe or do live streams because in my head i always kind of ascribed the idea of playing as part of the journey to get to the place that i want to get to which is playing in panorama bar playing at you know club division there playing at flipping robert johnson playing at fold all these places i want to play at this is the kind of the goal so when you're mixing and you're doing a live stream the idea is that okay this should hopefully be the one of the things that's going to get me closer to my goal 
but listening to this talk from Elijah kind of made me realize that no when I got into this thing as great as it was to promote parties and get free drink tokens and put on events for my friends and put out cool flyers and have people turn up and say that they loved your party that was always good the part of it that was also amazing was for me the discovery of music was being just a geek about music caring about who produced something um caring about how something was put out caring about how the albums were sequenced thinking of, i remember before i'd be thinking of i'd be listening to music and thinking all oh, right that'll go sick with this song and not even thinking about how i could play out that mix or transition just thinking oh that actually sounds similar to something i heard the other day or these things would actually go together or look at the trends happening in music at the same time those things i was thinking about and it wasn't always about making it making it and having your arms splayed out you know behind the decks looking at Carl Cox it was always just about enjoying the music and enjoying all that sort of stuff and I feel like Elijah's point here in his um Twitter thing that he put out which he's got the the image that says there aren't enough DJs another one called casually DJing is good for the soul I think it's really um hits home and I think a bit of his speech here kind of hit home for me in the truest sense of the words so I'm going to play a bit of what he's to say and I'm going to play a bit of the explanation and then obviously close it with some of my comments towards the end but this is Elijah Kersey of his Twitter page. You're fun. Hmm. Uh, I had so much DJ, angry DJs fighting me about this. <laughs> I, I know that, like, there's no angry DJs in here, like, because you want to come to something like this. Anyway, um, more people DJing casually is good for music. Yeah. Like, all DJing is, is creating and caring about your collection of music and putting it together. It, like the dance floor bit comes as well, if you want, but the deep care of what you listen to, to me is like the fundamental thing behind DJing. There's some people here that have got sick music in their stories all the time, but they're not DJs, but they care enough to like share little clips of st like the, what they're listening to and all this kind of stuff. I notice it, I'm like, you listen to good music constantly like you are, you've got a DJ mind, but you're not like may maybe applying it in a career DJ way, like book me, like, you know, I've got an agent, all this kind of stuff. Like all of us here are probably DJs in some form or, or fashion. You wouldn't say get in a car and just listen to anything. Like you do, you do care what's coming into your system. Which is amazing. Definitely something that I kind of um, can ascribe to. And then scrolling down, he kind of expands a bit on the point here. <clears throat> More people DJing casually is good for music. DJing is just creating, sharing, collecting music. And we've been doing that on computers for over 20 years now and recognizing some of our like ways of putting things together as DJing now, I think um, can take the whole medium and art form forward. Um, people think that DJing got democratized through like CDJs and controllers and virtual DJ. But to me, it got de democratized when um, MP3s became available, Napstar, Winamex, Kazaa, all of those kind of things, and the iPod. <laughs> like once you could make your own playlists yourself, um, use Winamp and kind of technologies like that, then everyone became a DJ. So now I don't view DJs as just the people that you know are in clubs, disc jockey in an old school way. I view uh, DJs as people that really deeply care about music, the way it's laid out, the way it's created in their lives, the sound systems that they play it on at home. And um, yeah, more people DJing casually is good for music. You should. And I agree with him. And I think for me, this has been a real sign in terms of how I want to position the things I want to do going forward, how I want to approach things because the, the brutal honesty, the brutal kind of facts of life and honesty about the situation is we don't all get to DJ. We don't always, we, we, all won't get the opportunity to play in some of these illustrious places that I want to play at, right? Whether it's festivals, whether it's big clubs, we all won't get the opportunity to have our arms splayed out wide like Carl Cox behind the stage somewhere, lapping up all the adulation as we play other people's music. It's just not going to happen that way. Life isn't fair. Um, you know, you can be the best technical DJ that you, that you want to be and somebody else can overstep you because of whatever else they have. It doesn't matter what the reason is, but just life isn't fair. Things don't work out that way for everyone. But... For me, it's never really been about that kind of thing. I think once you get into the scene and you start to get close enough to people, you start to see some of the higher ups. I think what can tend to happen, especially when you're somebody like myself, who's more of a, I'd say, sink kid than somebody else is trying to make it in the artist side of things. Because I, you know, even if I wasn't an artist, I still want to be going to raves and going to festivals and whatnot and going to clubs. I think what ends up happening is that once you go out a lot, 
you start to see a lot of really good people. But then once you go out a lot, also you start to see a lot of people playing in good places who aren't good. And if you have any kind of weather all about you and you're somewhat kind of coherent in your thought, there's no way that you're not going to think, I could do that. Especially with someone that's not good. It's pretty easy to say that because they're terrible, um, in your opinion, because you've seen so many different people. You've got enough of, a, um, you know, references to kind of go on in terms of, oh, I've seen this person play. They're not good as that person. Not good. I mean, you could just get a judge of it or maybe to your taste. And it kind of makes you think, hey, I could do that also. But unfortunately, because it's one of the easiest fields of music to kind of get started in, the barrier of entry is incredibly low, right? DJ equipment's getting cheaper and cheaper by the year. It's just incredibly crowded. Like, you know, I'm sure most people in metropolitan cities, most people in hipster communities will attest to the fact that they have a lot of people within their social group who they can regard as DJs, right? If they were to put up a post that said, hey, I've got a house party going on, I need someone to play, I'll give you a hundred quid. There'll be, a, you know, there'll be more than 10 people in your inbox telling you, hey, I can play, I can play, I can play, I can play. So clearly there's too many DJs and maybe not enough clubs. And with the amount of clubs closing, especially in the UK, it's getting harder and harder to play in places. There's also never really been a real culture, I feel like, with resident DJs and promoting local acts in the UK, especially in London, especially when all the drinking and drug rules came into place. I feel like a lot of clubs focused more so on booking big people because they have limited opening hours, so they have to guarantee that they're going to make their buck back. They have to guarantee they're going to be able to pay wages, and you just can't guarantee paying wages when you book resident DJs. You have to book some of the bigger names. I get it. So the ecosystem around it is kind of hard to get people to go from point where I'm at to suddenly playing at big festivals and big stages. It's just difficult. It's not a straight path. It's not even a wiggly path. It's just a very odd path to get into. Who knows how you get there? Who knows? Because you know, I myself could be doing a live stream on my channel one time and uploading on a consistent basis, and somebody from the agency would be like, "Hey, we want you to play at this place," and then suddenly I'm playing there. And, you know, maybe on paper, I have no right to be there, but my experience told me I have to be there. But then how did I get there? Because I have a channel. I mean, there's no real rhyme or reason behind it. Everything's kind of messed up. You hear people saying they kind of were toiling away in the slums or wherever they're from. They get one boiler room set and suddenly now all the agents, all the bookers realize that they're alive and they're getting booked all over the place. It just happens by randomness. It happens by luck, happened by connection. We don't know. There is no clear way. But for me, the love has always been about the DJing act itself, about being able to say that you can mix, being able to say that you can put together a set, being able to record the set, put it out, let people listen to it, be able to discover new music. And for me, the music thing has always been a really interesting part of it because I kind of always prided myself on the fact that I had really good taste. And most of the reason why I had good taste in music was because of DJing. Like I grew up in an area where I was listening to majority the, the the yeah the majority of music i was listening to growing up oddly enough was music i listened to on pirate radio which always happened to be garage which always happened to be jungle which always had to be dancehall which happened to be r&b those are the things i listened to man pick up the entertainment crew on deja back in the day that's stuff i listened to on a constant basis so when i got into djing it was easy for me to draw from those kind of genres because stuff i listened to but then when i started to kind of evolve and start to get more interested in djing i was started to be interested in other genres you know techno the houses all that sort of stuff but i feel like that also extended into my ability to listen to everything like recently i listened to the taylor swift album in four because i just like music so there's some tracks on there i like some stuff i don't like but that curiosity of listening to stuff wouldn't have come if i didn't dj Right, so my whole entire library of music is full of so many different variations of people I listen to that I put in playlists that I want to listen to when I'm going to the gym and shit. And most of it comes from that basis of just DJing for the love of it. And I feel like I've kind of lost it because I was obviously trying to chase that kind of booking and those kind of appeal, which obviously is great. And I'm not going to turn it down if it comes along the way. But in general, part of the reason of me doing what I'm doing on the DJing side of things, recording mixes and live streams on my YouTube channel and putting those out and putting, you know, um, turning those live streams into mp3s and putting them on soundcloud the reason why i'm doing that is because i want people to hear the stuff that i play and to be impressed by how i dj not because i want oh you know people to could see that and kind of take that to a book or somewhere and say oh can you book this guy that's obviously amazing but the main thing is to share my love of playing and i feel like that reminder from elijah was definitely needed especially now that i'm kind of thinking about going back out again and getting myself back on that kind of wagon and streaming again because i've been kind of slacking for a while but especially when you go out it's 
there's no way you can't get inspired going out to places you know i've just been out to fabric of course as i mentioned at the continuum um label night was it like continuum and flipping sorry blueprint records night seeing flipping Rene wise and dave clark play was absolutely incredible so there's no way you can't not get inspired by that sort of stuff and that kind of makes you kind of fall in love with the thing again but the thing itself is already fun being able to being able to you know stand behind a pair of CDJs for the first time and figure it out is fun. Being as if standing in front of a mixer or a MIDI player is fun. It's all fun figuring out what cable goes where is fun. How to load tracks, um, how to prep your tracks on record box like crates, like losing crates, you know, making playlists, sub create all this stuff is flipping fun to do. Honestly, it really is fun, and it's something that I kind of want to get back into for the love of for the sake of just doing it, not because I'm doing it with an outcome in mind. That's all. I want to be. I want to be devoid of, of an outcome. I want to be devoid of outcome and just enjoying the process for what it is, which I was doing prior, but I kind of got caught up in the idea of being the guy out with his arms splayed out behind the deck because it's not that really important. Obviously, it's great to do, but the major part of it is just being in love with the tunes again. So big up Elijah for that reminder. I appreciate you, brother. Talking about reminders and clubs and stuff, the december lineup for Berghain has been released it just dropped butter it just dropped hot off the shelves Berghain december lineup has just dropped and i'm pumped and eager and ready to dive on deep now from what i understand the month in the head always comes this yeah i think if you want to see the january set list or lineup you have to wait until December the 6th. I think it comes after the 6th, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe I'm mistaken, who knows? But I think that's how it works. That's how people time knowing when to kind of check the website. It always comes after the 6th, I think so. Um, so, you know, if you want to check in advance, always check the, uh, the you know on the 6th day before the month you want to go. So, December's out already. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? There's a lot of talk around Bergen at the moment about whether it's going to close or not. Loads of rumours going around. I dispelled some of those because of what I've been told or heard. I've heard other rumours now that conflict against it. Who really knows what's going out there? But there's no point in putting out conflicting, non-sourced, non-credible information just to confuse people and get people upset and angry. Just enjoy the space for what it is and what it's able to offer. And I've also seen way more dissenting voices about Bergen as a space overall, which I'm really curious to dive into. I actually might load up an actual um, image of it of somebody speaking about it actually the other day. I think that business Teshno shared because I'm really curious to see how the clubbing community overall or just the operators in the scene, whoever they are, approach it going forward because clearly it feels like there is maybe an appetite for something else. Who knows what the something else is? Maybe these rumors are just coming out of left field, but I feel like when people start talking like this about you, people start counting, I know it happens every year, it's happened since this club has been popular, but it feels like nowadays people kind of disparaging the place or especially people who are from Berlin, basically making their point to let you know they never go there and they go to all these other places. It feels like the cool kids are maybe falling out of love with it. It feels like a lot of the normies are kind of getting involved with it. It may be heading in a more commercial route, who knows? Um, but it feels like there's something in the air. People are kind of, it feels like praying and hoping for the Berghain's downfall, which is, you know, what is what it is. But I want to know what people actually want to replace it. What's the future going forward? Because if there is going to be a handing over of the guard, there needs to be something else that replaces it. Because at the moment, for me, there's nothing else in the scene out there that is, comes up to this. Like in terms of, and again, it's never usually about the nights and people that go there. It's about the consistency. You can go here every single weekend and have a splendid night from the Artello Rama night to the FC Snacks night. Like there's continual, absolute bangers of nights and people playing. And that's, I think, the major part of people kind of lose of it. Like say what you want about the entry policy, the security, whatever else, or the people that go there. But the range of people that play week in week out you can't find anywhere else you can just go there blindly so what's going to replace it how they're going to replace it it's going to be a hard road to go down who knows but anyway december 2022 lineup is out i tell a rama bar night like crazy crazy good lineup i love the name obviously most of the people playing there if not all are going to be i tell a disco fanatics um you got kendall live dj katana emil doesn't drive frinda del lanco back to back with hendrik stein and Stet and sesto senso the one thing i'm interested in as well because i used to love playing i tell a disco back in the day and flipping dawson basement bars or whatnot you don't really see many kind of black djs playing this type of music in it. i wonder why that is is there is there a scene 
of black art because there's a lot of kind of really cool cuts that use kind of black vocals and shit or black musician vocals sorry in some of their records especially if you get into the italo house type of stuff but the italo disco scene um it's very flamboyant it's very kind of exuberant very out there um it's very groovy right it kind of makes you want to dance um which is not something you can say for a lot of dance music it really does have a bop to it it's a wonder why there's not many more black people that actually kind of dj that type of stuff even just disco or overall maybe the disco overall is not a good term because there's many people in places like peckham and shit that play disco all the time but when it comes to i tell a disco i wonder what it is about that genre of music that doesn't necessarily call for black people to play obviously maybe you don't want to play it you know i'm not going to play that music wearing a versace shirt and a handlebar mustache right and loads of really expertly placed tattoos and shit that's probably not what i'm going to be doing but um, I still think it's a genre of music that we could absolutely crush, but we don't. I wonder why that is. Who knows? Um, the following night, um, September the so um, December the third on the Saturday, you've got an SE Snacks United, <laughs> which is hilarious. Um, and then you've got uh, dress dress code on this is strictly dress sneakers and sportswear. So if you're the kind of gay dude that's into that kind of whole sportswear vibe, which I didn't know was a thing. I remember going to a few hashtags on Twitter and stuff and finding some pretty wild stuff about some of the things that gay guys are into in terms of guys who wear that who kind of have a chavy look about them, the shaved heads, the TNs, the really tight tracksuits, the white socks. Um, that kind of look is really popular with some gay guys and they absolutely love it. So clearly that's going to be an absolutely mad one. Um, the athletes party at flipping, what's it think? Uh, Lab and Bergheim is going to be men only play safe. And uh, in that lineup, they've got LSD XOX. They've got Luigi De Verni. they got Partox in Laboratory, which is the which is the predominantly the gay room which i've never actually been in actually even when the i think the club sylvester opened i think they're going there no, i didn't i think they're going there i might have gone in there i'm not too sure but i've actually seen what it looks like on the inside so that's an interesting one to check out well my own eyes i've seen the pictures but not my own eyes but laboratory on that night is going to be chris cruz grace sands stat this and wes bagley that's going to be a pretty sick affair as well to be honest december you know when you're meant to be with your family and stuff you're gonna go to fc snacks break whoa dirty then the following then the follow then the same sorry then the same saturday oh look at that so i guess it's on the same weekend they got fc snacks on Berghain and then i guess they're gonna close it and then you're gonna be able to go to the main room and see these people playing um it feels like daria Corvosa is playing like so often at Bergheim. Is she now a resident or something? Because I know that the boyfriend or husband is right in terms of Etta Kyle, but is she a resident there? Because I feel like she plays there so often these days. Um, anyway, uh, Bergheim, uh, a Sontag, I've been okay. So I guess this is what Saturday after seven, after five or something, right? Or it's closed or something. Maybe that's what it means. It's closed. I'm not sure what that. What, 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 does, what does that mean? Sontag. Da, 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 da. Let's see if I can look that up. Uh, search. Where is it? Let's see if we can translate this. I don't really know what this means. Berghain ab Sontag abend 17 euro. Something about the hour. Let's see if I can do a translation of this. Ooh. Oh man, Google will translate. Because I'm pretty sure it's something to do with that, right? Oh, no, not that. Uh, let's go back to it again. It's this. And then where is this? That one, right? Let's go. Okay, so Berghain from Sunday. Sontag is Sunday. Jesus Christ. I should actually know this stuff. I, mean, I go to Berlin often enough. I should know my flipping Monday to flipping Saturday, Sundays. What is it actually? Um, so I guess from Berghain Sunday evening from 5 p.m. But let's see. What is it? German Monday to Sunday. What is it? Okay, cool. Let's see. Days of the week in German. I should actually know this because I go there often enough, like I said. So, um, Sunday, Sonntag. Monday, Montag. Tuesday, Dienstag. Wednesday, Mittwoch. Mittwoch is Wednesday. I would have never guessed that, man. Don Donnerstag. It's Thursday. Donnerstag. Dunnerstag. Um, Friday, free Freitag. And then Saturday is Sonabend, Sonabend, or Zumstag, Zumstag or Sonabend. Okay, Jesus Christ, that's a mad pronunciation. But anyway, let's go back to the lineup. So in that one, 
you've got Marcel Dietman playing live on the third, Dariko Volsa, Kos, Kolosova, Freddie K, Matrix Man. Panorama Bar, you've got Carrie Star, DJ Fart in the club. That's an absolutely amazing name. Job Jobs, Job Jobsy, sorry. Um, Kili, Kiki Kalomo, Kiki Lomo, Palms Tracks, Paula Tape and Tear. And then on the following weekend, you've got Refugee Worldwide, um, which is Bradley Zero, back to back with Sally C, No Plastic, back to back with Richard Ab, Arbington, Stella Zerki, and Yang Sung. And then the following weekend, which is probably the standout one, this is December the 10th, might be the standout lineup. 100% the standout lineup. Look at this. You've got three rooms open Bergkind, Panorama Bar, and Hull. The, the, the Hull night is where they put all the gigs, I'm assuming. I've been there before. I went there during the Club Sylvester, and that was a fucking amazing space. Um, so from Bergkind, you've got Terence Fixum Alive. Ben Clock, Boris, Francois, Francois X, Josie Rebel, Big Up in the UK, Justin Perry, Steffi and Surgeon. Paranormal Bar, you've got Miss Kitten, also goes by Kitten now, and The Hacker going live. That album, if you haven't got it already, please check it out. You've got Ad Agina playing, you've got Arm playing in Paranormal Bar, Cassie, Fred P, Lakuti, N. Balkema, Tamasomo and Virginia. <laughs> The only thing that's missing there, apparently, by Steffi to make it an all rounder. Then in How Bar, you in How Main Room, you've got DJ Gigola, you've got Key Cliff Live, you've got Labour Live, you've got Alexander, you've got Claudio PRC, you've got Nick Nack and the Seventh Plane. That is an absolute heavy night. So if you're planning on going in December, please note these dates are going to be crazy in terms of going there. They're going to be so full. People are going to be paying top dollar to go there. I actually want to check and see how much flights are there at that time anyway. Let me see what they're saying. Because I'm assuming they're going to be super, super expensive to go. Airbnbs are going to be through the roof. But if you do want to go on that December, let me see if I can check one out there. As you can see, some of the uh, dates on there that I'm already checking out myself. So let's go here, scan down to London Stansted. That's where I'll be going from. And then I'll be obviously going to Berlin, Bradenburg. This airport is so annoying now. I definitely prefer the other one, but hey, let's say that rather better. Let's say you're going to go on a weekend. So it'll be December 9th for leaving and then returning on the Monday the 12th. Oops. Go right there again, yeah, Monday the 12th. So that's done, right? And then boom, return flight. Let's see how much it's going for. Let's see on that bang storming weekend. That bit is going to be crazy. Oh, look at that. £116. This is without even flipping bags and shit already it's that much and look at the difference in terms of the saturday crazy and then on the way back is 60 okay it's a bit cheaper coming back but still absolute brutal to go there that night and you know that weekend it's going to be an absolute arm and a leg so it's definitely definitely crazy but that is one of the better lineups i've seen in a very very long time um no idea when the club Sylvester is going to happen so if you anyone does actually know the club Sylvester is usually the new year's day kind of event sort of stuff because it falls on a weird time in it because friday's new friday's the third then yeah new year's eve is on like saturday and then new year's day is on the sunday so i wonder if they're going to open specifically the club the sylvester stuff and start it on the sunday and have it go all the way through the week or will they start in the following week weekend instead in the general i'm not too sure so if anyone has any idea please let me know in the comments down below um after the 10th of the barn summer on that friday you then got ad for 93 i feel like these panorama bars on a friday are a bit of an undercover success i'd love to go to them but again i don't have in time to go too much on the friday so i always have to leave on a saturday but this night on the 16th of december is nice too you got an Anunaku playing Minor Science, Shannon SP and Willow. Willow I'm a big fan of. So that should be pretty sick as well, Panorama Bar. Then the following day, you've got uh, Burkhine on the 17th. You've got Aku playing Bestie Hira, DJ P. Or DJ P, I saw a player flocking uh, Paloma Bar back to back with what's his face? Oh, with the guy that I flipping love. And I forgot his complete name that does a powerhouse. So he's really cool to go and check out. Marina, Nini H is always good. Orlando Vaughan, Pramble State playing, awesome. Panama you got Bin, um, the South Korean legend. Is that South Korean legend? That, 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 that is her, right, Bin? Bin's a South Korean girl, right? If I'm not mistaken. Or am I mistaken? Am I mistaken? Yeah, I am mistaken. It's not the same person. I'm sorry, somebody else. Who's Bin? Who's Bin? 
okay, well, they're Asian. That's 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 a start. <laughs> but I don't think they're South Korean. But anyway, regardless, big up Bin. So Bin, <laughs> Bin's playing there. Let's go back again. Bin's there. Um, then you got Brian Kessler, Dasko, Dinky, Gono, Nat Wilder, and Seth Troxler playing. Ooh, interesting. Seth Troxler playing at Panorama Bar. Wow. It's interesting booking because I would imagine, because they always do this anyway, they always have like, they'll have like a really commercial person playing in the Panorama Bar in general, or maybe Bergheim to kind of mix things up a bit. They've had Solomon play. I've said before, I've heard DJ Harvey play. That was one of my best nights I've ever been at Bergheim the team. DJ Harvey smashed that main room. It was incredible. What a privilege. And obviously Seth Trucks are playing now. But it's interesting with Seth because I feel like Seth's at his most commercial ever probably now. And I'm fortunate with someone like myself who's a huge fan of his and was obsessed with him when he was coming up and would watch all his interviews and would hang on his every word and would be, you know, aggressively pointing my phone towards the laptop trying to get his flipping tune ideas of his tracks he was playing when he used to play vinyl only. Like, I love that guy, but we can't deny that he's not the same DJ he was before. Like, he's not as good anymore. I don't know it's because he's over it, because he's maybe hit his ceiling, but the, the Seth Troxler that I was kind of obsessive as a fan growing up is definitely a different I won't say growing up because I don't think he's even that older that that old compared to me or whatever but still um the only problem I said like I said like his ability to play has gone somewhat down and also his fame has gone super high so he's quite commercial you you would describe him as so it's pretty interesting that they're booking him to be honest it's similar to them booking flipping black coffee do you know what I mean um obviously black coffee is you know uh, maybe productions are maybe hitting a bit better nowadays because obviously they fall in that kind of sound bracket that everyone wants to hear now but interesting booking nonetheless that should be cool and then on the 25th of December they're open on Christmas bloody day crazy and um, finest Xmas they've got um, David um, Elick McPlaying Mary Moxtamir who I've been raving about for a while she's absolutely incredible they've got partock playing roy perez who i've always got good things to say about and then the 30th 30th club now she got all these floors open which i'm pretty sure this might be the club sylvester maybe that might be the one this might be so it might be club sylvester from the 30th to the 31st to the first to the second it might go all the way through i think so i'm thinking about it now i think that's what they might do so it might not be what i want because i want to go and party from the first all the way until the sixth but i think they might just do it from the first or whatever and then i think sometimes they close on january so am i not mistaken do they sometimes close the january afterwards or am i not or am i mistaken let me see if i can select a random year pre-pandemic let's go for 2019 let's see january 2019 or yeah or yeah january, let's do january 2019 did they close before that no they don't they are okay they reopen straight away so i guess the the 31st was before that oh no see look hmm okay so this is okay on a tuesday and they did it randomly on a tuesday on the 2019th they did their new year's day party on the tuesday all the way through crazy isn't it all the way through to wednesday i'm assuming or thursday and then they closed that following weekend and they came back again the following okay cool so i guess after the sylvester so what i'm basically thinking is that that weekend after so if we get the calendar calendar 2022 i think that weekend that i want to go especially for the new year's day thing so this is 2022 so the event that they're putting on if i'm not mistaken let's put this around over here it's gonna be on the 30th so let's go back here again this gets up on the screen so that's the 30th so i'm assuming the party that they want to do the new year's day thing will probably happen all the way through will probably happen there on the sunday which is the first of january all the way until probably wednesday or something or tuesday and then that following and then that same they're basically that week of january this one so i'm assuming it's going to close on that weekend from the 6th to the 8th so it probably won't be open that weekend i'm assuming 6th 7th 8th um january of, of 2023 i'm assuming that's going to be the case that's what they're probably going to end up doing maybe i'm wrong who knows but i assume that'll probably be the uh, the uh tide i'll probably go for but i'd love to go man. maybe on a sunday I might go do a little quick one all the way through who knows but that'll be a good time to duck out and go but yeah incredibly good lineup in december as per usual no surprise 
they're always flipping kill it. Looks like they're not gonna closing anytime soon. So for people that are wishing and praying on the Berg's demise, you're gonna have to wish on a bloody star, mate. You're gonna have to keep wishing on a star. All right, moving on from that one. Um, I want to move on to. Let's talk about this year a little bit. So, um, it's a hard, hard, hard slog for people out there, man. Like it feels like every single day I'm hearing big, big, big companies laying off a huge amount of people. Obviously, some of the biggest ones were obviously Twitter, with um, Elon Musk announcing that he was taking over and deciding he was going to kind of trim stuff down and make him a bit of a lean operation. But that kind of felt like him just flexing his muscle as the kind of boss and basically whipping people into shape, you know, similar to what Jose Mourinho used to do when he used to first get his job at a big club. He would essentially, you know, bench somebody really integral to the team. He'd come into a, a really you know, established team, maybe with established hierarchy, and he'd go after somebody who everybody kind of felt was maybe un not untouchable, but somebody that no one really kind of messed with, maybe because of their status, maybe because of their record at the club, maybe because of the profession or whatever, maybe he'd cause a problem with that person just to kind of let it be known that he's got smoke with everybody. And usually there'd always be one or two sacrificial lambs that you kind of get rid of. And I feel like, you know, people maybe saw the Elon you know, Musk um, job cuts at Twitter being a kind of representation of that of him basically you know basically asserting his authority but this announcement that came recently just the other day it's just courtesy of the verge it says meta formerly known as facebook announces huge job cuts affecting eleven thousand employees it's absolutely brutal and it's clearly a wake-up call and a reminder for someone like myself who's working and who myself previously had a very i'd say careless relationship when it came to employment and kind of felt like I was above jobs and stuff and felt like, you know, there was always something cool around the corner for me or that I would be doing my own thing. So who cares about the thing that I've got? I really do thank the pandemic for kind of humbling me because for the, I won't say the majority, but for the first half of the pandemic, maybe the first year of it, um, I was unemployed, right? I, you know, the job that I had going into the pandemic, unfortunately I lost. And then um, I was struggling to find anything in that time because clearly people were gun shy or hiring shy, sorry. Um, and they didn't want to get hire more people and the, the field that I was working at the time, which was mostly marketing, social media and influencer stuff, wasn't necessarily the place that people would be hiring more people to work in during the pandemic and during a downturn in the economy and whatnot. Even more people were consuming more content online than ever before and more influencer -led content, but still it was difficult to find positions. And the fact that everybody was sort of out of work, it kind of made the job market very competitive. So maybe in previous years, I would have been able to find something quicker, but because I was competing with people who had better experience than me, who were maybe more senior than me, um, it very it made the, the job competition thing much harder and it was a lot brutal to take because you'd be applying for roles, maybe getting somewhere, maybe getting past the first or second hurdle and then clearly being told, hey, we picked somebody else before you because they're better, because they had more experience, because they had prepared a better, you know, presentation whatever it may be so it kind of was harder to take because beforehand you know people just air you maybe not reply but when people are giving you detailed analysis of reports of why you didn't get the job because i think at that time also people were very sensitive to getting rejection so a lot of companies were being pressured to provide some feedback so it made it very tense but i was thankful that i did get something and when i did get it i did had a new kind of appreciation and a, you know um, for jobs in general and what it could provide for you and the ability to pay your bills, the ability to feed yourself, put clothes on your back and also the ability it gave me to do the things I wanted to do, right? To buy microphones, to buy cameras, to be able to set up a podcast, all this sort of stuff comes because I'm able to be employed somewhere and have a regular nine to five that's able to kind of offset these costs and allow me to do the things that I'm actually passionate about. And if it turns into a full-time gig, of course, amazing, but my bread and butter always has to be the kind of job I got. So when I see this sort of stuff, it kind of, it kind of hits home a little bit more because I went through a rocky period in my life, especially during the pandemic. And also I'm more appreciative of my roles now than ever before. But also to be honest, I think if I was a Facebook, if I was a Meta employee, if I was a Twitter employee, I don't think I would have been naive enough to just wait around for them to make this decision. I would have been cognitive of the world around me and made my adjustments here and there. But I also understand how difficult it is to do that when you're an adult and you've got people to look after and stuff. I get it, I get it. But this is pretty gruesome, man. Meta announces huge job cuts affecting 11,000 employees, courtesy of The Verge. It says Meta's announced 
to lay off 11,000 employees or around 13% of the company's total staff. CEO Mark Zuckerberg announced the news in a blog post saying that he was at fault for being over-optimistic about the company's future growth based on the pandemic surge. At the start of COVID, he said, the world rapidly moved online and the search for e-commerce led to an outsized revenue growth. Many people predicted this would be permanent and acceleration that would continue even after the pandemic ended. I did too. So I made a decision to significantly increase our investments. Unfortunately, this did not play out the way I expected. I like that how he is referring to the workforce as investments and he's not using any language to belittle or demean or to diminish um, what those people did during that time and what they were hired under the premise of because I'd imagine a lot of those people were sold a bit of a dream in their interview in terms of growth, in terms of what the company said and looking to go and then, you know, a few months down the line, suddenly now you're out of a job. So I love the fact that he's kind of choosing his words widely here. Unfortunately, da, 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 it's not how I expected. Zuckerberg said the company could now become leaner and more efficient by cutting spending and staff and shift more resources to a smaller number of high priority growth areas, including ads, AI, and the metaverse. He's still going on with that bloody hell. Zuckerberg said that the company's recruiting team would be particularly disproportionately affected by the cuts department. Um, oh, really? So it's mostly recruitment. Jesus. Meta reported um, some 87,000 employees in September, which today's layoff making the first broad cut since the firm was founded in 2004. Oh, so this might be, this might not even be founding members. This might just be people who've been there for a while and also people who just never left, which is probably the same thing, but you know what I mean? Like, fuck me, 87,000 employees. Um, why has Meta hit so hard? Well, a projected downturn in the US economy has blunted momentum for many tech stocks, but the company's prospects have been affected by the both strong competition from its rivals and wayward strategy. The rise of TikTok and the changes in Apple's privacy policy have squeezed Meta's financial lucrative business model, while the company's investments in the Nansen um, Metaverse look increasingly misguided. Meta has lost 9.4% billion of this metaverse technology <laughs> in 2022 so far and says they expect to spend seven even more on a business in the future they've already lost 9.4 billion on metaverse tech and they already want to lose more startups exist in another world man meanwhile the company's factory metaverse social platform horizon worlds is so buggy and unpopular that meta's own managers have been forced to shame employees into using it i remember i reading something about Elon thing in Twitter that was from a very smart person who said the issue that a lot of people in tech might have to wake up to I think yeah I think it was around the issue around Elon sacking everybody at Twitter or I think it was 11% of the was it 11% I don't know what percent it was I remember somebody smart saying something along the lines of the issue here for people is that if he proves the concept correct like if Musk is able to come into Twitter lean make them a leaner more meaner operation get rid of all the fluff, do that whole Twitter blue thing with the verification badge and everything else has been going, generate some money that way, but basically be able to prove that you can make money with Twitter and it could be somewhat profitable by not having so many, you know, not having a bloated workforce. Other startups might do the same because startups in general are very copycatty in everything that they do. So if somebody else is able to kind of get away with having a PR team of one, they might also decide, you know what, we don't need... 17 people in PR we just need maybe two or one also and they might copy and follow suit so that's the the risk you know at hand for people who work at startups where you know founders must start questioning very strongly held beliefs that they've had for a while because Elon Musk comes in with a fresh idea of how to approach things especially if you look at how he's done stuff like SpaceX or Tesla there's loads of staff turnaround whether it's people hiring and firing whether it's them leaving themselves so clearly it's something that he kind of abides by especially when it comes to kind of cutting cost it's a quick way to do it because I'm assuming they probably all pay pretty well so if you get rid of those people straight away you can you know ease up the flipping uh, books and use that money to be applied into different areas of the business and whatnot but God damn it, man. I can't imagine 87, you know, what you call it? What is it? 11,000 11, people being sacked, you know, just before Christmas. And also, this is also a good reminder for me and realization that I'm not an entrepreneur. I think for the longest time, when I was kind of growing up, I kind of saw myself being the guy that would be, you know, founding his own million dollar startup or something or going on shark tank or going on dragon's den and doing that kind of thing right or running sorry three different businesses at the same time whether it's something in property whether it's a tech company whatever maybe right doing this thing and juggling it or actually being a real entrepreneur in that regard 
and I think as life has progressed, I realized that of course, what I actually want is the freedom, the luxury to do the things that I want to do. Um, the kind of uh, lifestyle freedom, right? The location independency, to be able to kind of make money off my own dime sort of thing, off the surf my own brow. But that doesn't mean you're an entrepreneur. That might mean you're creative. That might mean you're, uh, um, I don't know, a hustler, whatever it may be, whatever that term is, but it doesn't mean you're an entrepreneur because entrepreneurs, this is what this is the hard part of it they show you all the lambos on flipping social media and shit but they don't show you and you have to flip and let go of eleven thousand people some of which have families and stuff depending on that salary they get you know just before christmas it doesn't matter if they get a severance or not it doesn't matter if the severance is a year the fact that you still don't have a job in that uncertainty the fact that you've had this job probably since 2004 maybe later is brutal so Thoughts and feelings go out for everybody out there that's been affected by it. Hopefully, you land on your feet. Hopefully, you land on your feet. And for those of you who do have jobs who take it for granted, working in creative fields and want to do things outside of your career, honor your job, respect your job, and treat it like the main B I T C H it is because that job is what funds everything else that you're doing, especially if you're not full time and you're doing anything that you want to do yet. Don't take it for granted because you never know when that thing can get taken away from you and then suddenly life becomes real again and you don't need to have that realization before you have you have you have that realization. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. Moving on. We have to talk about we have to talk about Drake and Twenty One Savage album Her Loss. What an absolute banger. Unfortunately it wasn't a surprise drop. I would have liked it to be a surprise drop, but the fact that DJ Academics, you know, um double hamburger filled face couldn't help himself to spill the news bless him um you know if I, if I was flipping in communication with drake also i'd probably want to maybe spill the news and he basically alluded to it for some reason some of us carty fanboys thought it was going to be a playboy carty album i don't know why we thought that maybe because he said something about the people maybe not being the person not being press friendly i don't know for some reason we thought it was it was flipping gonna be cardi it's gonna be sorry play with cardi then obviously it was announced through drake and 21 savage that they were gonna put the album out so we put the things together because you're saying it's a big person surprise drop bloody blah, blah 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 and then we finally got the news so the surprise was kind of ruined a little bit but the music wasn't i don't think anybody and myself included and i would count myself to be a pretty much a bit of a fan of music and shit i'm a bit clued up i had no idea what was coming out no idea on the tunes no idea what i'm pro show going for zero even the title her loss i didn't really have an idea what the theme they were kind of going for and what kind of angle they were kind of pursuing the album artwork came out i didn't really have any clue about it either it's some random you know uh what you call it dancer from some atlanta club i guess more people are familiar with her than i am but she seems cool but in general i didn't have anything to no prior knowledge of it and i think that was quite refreshing when it comes to a drake album and off the back of that tech house album that came out that everyone hated especially people in north america i think this was a good reminder of just how good drake is at rapping I think he does the melodic thing really well. He obviously enjoys it. He obviously has the versatility and the ability to do Afro beats, to do probably I'm a piano. He's obviously some illustration of that to do the tech house stuff, to do the melodic house stuff, to do the minimal, whatever you want to call it, that genre of things. He's clearly versatile in the fact that he can jump on different, you know, sounds, especially the UK rap stuff, UK drill stuff, clearly. But when it comes to the bread and butter of being able to rap, on hip hop traditional hip hop beats or you know beats that you would kind of describe to be more hip hop than whatever else he's an elite level rapper like really up there and that's one thing I've, i was happy that got showcased on his album i think most of us kind of had a feeling it would happen because it was drake and 21 savage it was it was unlikely that 21 savage was going to suddenly be harmonizing all over the, the flipping album even though he has a couple of tracks on their way he is kind of singing which is quite cool but for the most part we knew if drake was going to be doing a collab tape with 21 savage that most likely it would be him going bar for bar back to back style and it was absolutely everything that i wanted to hear and more and for me it's been on repeat in my playlist listening to front and back um since it dropped in the gym it's the perfect in my opinion gym album maybe with a couple of you know um omissions here or there you can take out an, a track that you don't want here and there i know with apple music you just delete tracks if you don't want them on the album itself or you can make a whole entire playlist of an album that you want to listen to in terms of this overall sound but from front to back i feel like this is the easily in my opinion the most cohesive drake album there has been in a very very long time especially off the back of that tech house album which i probably think might 
might have been a bit of a master stroke in terms of putting an album out that's going to divide opinion and then off the back of that put out an album that's going to really hit home with your fans this is a great way to do it it's kind of a feel like that um honestly never mind was maybe a bit of a palate cleanser and then you hit them with flipping her loss and then suddenly everyone's like back on the flipping uh drake hype train again um, but 21 also, you know, spun the block and did absolutely amazing on here. Um, obviously, my standout track, that one, something I've kind of been playing on repeat, on bloody repeat, has been Back Outside Boys, uh, Privileged Rappers is amazing. There's a video to it now that kind of spoofs on the whole Colors thing that I'm obviously a big fan of. Um, what else is there that I love? Um, I love Pussy and Millions with Travis Scott. That's a very, very good tune. Broke Boys, I'm a big fan of that. Also, Middle of the Ocean, where Drake spazzes for six minutes is absolutely incredible. Uh, Free Amy and Glenwood is pretty cool because it sounds like it should be a track by Drake because we didn't see who was on each track and it's only got one feature with Travis Scott, which is interesting. But it sounds like it should be a feature with Drake. It should be a Drake kind of track, but it's not. It's a Tony One Savage track, so that's awesome. And then um, I guess it's fucked me to end it as well. It's absolutely a balance of an album to kind of go through. But an absolutely splendid album from beginning to end. I can't really say anything wrong about it. The only thing I would say is a slight wrong about it is the end of BS. Is it the end of BS on bullshit? I think it's the end of on bullshit. There's this skit that they feature where it features this guy, Alpha Car, who you know don't really know much about him but the only thing i knew of him prior was that he was close friends with virgil very connected to that whole crew of people and um he did actually a pretty decent interview with um i think i've got the podcast on complex they talk about trainers and he gave some really cool insights about virgil and their friendships and clearly they were very close clearly something that he was pretty still hurt up and caught up about but it was good to hear from an actual friend of his about how virgil was behind the scenes and how they kind of came up together and he essentially from all accounts is basically a celebrity car dealer to the stars but he does it in an interesting way because he's not only you know doing the standard you know lamborghini flipping trucks and shit it's absolutely a car aficionado thing he's actually a car head he's buying stuff that's been made you know what's this is a ferrari from the 70s or 80s i don't know what years they are but loads of old and vintage um cars that obviously people that are only into cars will actually appreciate and people obviously love him for that there's oh my god is that a, is that a golf gti Maybe there is a golf shoes, yeah, there. there's one there, but clearly someone has plugged into that sort of scene. But it comes across pretty cool in terms of cars, get it? I understand the vibe. But the smack talk that he's speaking on this album, I just don't believe. He's talking about the Paris lights and about turning things on, and I'm this guy, like, he is talking some crud, some big, big crud, and it just doesn't sound believable because you look at the dude and you don't think that, he's on that time at all you don't you know the only lights he's turning off are his bedroom lamp light do you know what i mean you don't necessarily think he's turning off any lights off on the other the tower so i felt that little segment was a bit weird and also because drake essentially i always feel like is somebody that feels like to me he's very anti paris fashion week i don't feel like he's one of the drippy artists that kind of runs the paris fashion week because paris fashion week kind of feels especially for menswear it feels like it's the it feels like it's the Met Gala for the lads, isn't it? For the straights, right? <laughs> Paris Fashion Week, especially men's. It's a Met Gala for the straights. So they all run over there to put their best outfit on to get fucking sunned and embarrassed by these flipping French aristocrats and socialites and shit. But they go there to get seen and be heard and whatnot. And, you know, he's there partaking. But I always felt like Drake was the kind of he went against it he didn't really like to vibe with it too much i don't really think i've seen many images of drake at paris fashion week hanging out having a good time he doesn't necessarily go he tends to kind of avoid it for some reason so to have this guy who i would describe as the quintessential paris fashion week dude oh yeah this is him he was on the complex show um what's it called the complex sneaker show but to have him on this type of show or to have him on this album just felt a little bit weird to me felt a little bit cringe if i'm being completely honest i didn't like it in the slightest um and I had to skip it. And it kind of took me out of the zone of listening to the album. You know what I mean? It just, the, the, I didn't believe the bass in his voice when you're saying the things that he was saying. Nothing felt believable. It just felt a little bit lame. So I wasn't necessarily the biggest fan of it myself. You know, and calling yourself Alpha Car as well is a little bit lame. I, I don't know if that's his actual name. Who knows? But regardless, I've, I've always had a thing with people who wear car merch anyway. I feel like it's proper wild ad things to be walking around with car merch. It's probably just as bad as people who wear Black Sabbath t-shirts and can't name a single song or don't know who Ozzy Osbourne is it's incredibly lame right obviously you know selling flipping luxury French cars pays isn't it Do you know what I mean you get you get booed up with a little little little, little ting but 
I always feel like people who dress, you know, in car merch, you know, look, my man, hopefully he's an actual mechanic because standing around in a mechanic shop with a t-shirt on, with a towel on, looking like you're working is like, oh, prime, prime loser behavior. But yeah, I just didn't like him on the album. I didn't like, the only thing that I didn't like that really snapped me out of it and I would rather not have him on there personally as a little skit thing, but I get it. If people did enjoy it, I get it. If you did enjoy it, um... And then the other thing that I thought was pretty cool about it was the response from Ice Spice. I thought she responded pretty well to a lyric that people attribute to being a Drake diss towards her on Back, House, Back Outside Boys, um, where he says something along the lines of, she a 10 trying to rap, it's good on mute. <laughs> yeah, because the entire album essentially is a, uh, it's kind of like a, the misogynist greatest hits. Right, it's a it's an album made for the fellas. I feel like it's definitely something Future would definitely agree with in terms of some of the sentiments being said on that track, on that record overall. And I thought that bar from Drake is definitely something that personified it. Right, she's a ten trying to rap, or she a, she a ten trying to rap. It's good on mute, and obviously she replied. And I thought like her reply was absolutely great and right on the money. And I thought for me was proof that I Spice would definitely have a long and prosperous career in the scene, collect her coins and just sail off into the sunset. I feel she'll have a good one. Even if it doesn't last that long, she'll make her money because she doesn't take herself too seriously and is able to joke and laugh at the meme. And she responded to that and said, at least I'm a 10. Shrug emoji, laugh, crying, laughing out loud emoji, which I thought was a perfect reply. And of course, people on social media, ever the miserable cunts that they are, she's not really a 10, so he's probably not talking about her. It's probably somebody else. Like, shut up. Keep it to yourself. No one cares what you think. So I thought that was absolutely brilliant. So big up her. Um, and then, uh, what was that? What, what was on Circo Loco that I went to speak about here? Was this the Megan line? I think that might have been the Megan line. Was it? Yeah, that was, yeah. So, of course, the Circo Loco track was the flipping Megan line that everyone was flipping going crazy about, which I don't necessarily think was that big of a deal. Um, if anything, it was maybe a really clever play on words, a double entendre. But also, I think in general, you're allowed to joke and laugh about things that happen in culture. You should be able to, right? The lyric itself from Circle Loco is goes as follows. Um, this bitch lie about getting shots, but she's still a stallion. She don't get the joke, but she's still smiling. And for me, I feel like this is a clear double entendre, which it could mean it was a diss, but it also could mean whatever the internet has convinced itself it means with flipping Drake allegedly talking about this other lady called Elk the Stallion, who was a former video vixen from years ago, who allegedly had, you know, a really incredible flipping bum who lied about not getting shots, but she did, blah, blah, blah. So it could be a play on words in that regard, you know, shots, Megan getting shot, shots in the arse, who knows? But we know deep down, majorly, most likely it's probably a shot at Megan. But even if it was, who cares? It's an event that happened in culture. If it goes proven to be incorrect, it's right. But you should be allowed to joke and comment on things in rap, even if it means you're kind of doing it in a somewhat disparaging way. That's the same way we speak. You should be able to rap the same way you speak. I don't get the flipping uproar behind it. But of course, if you're on Megan's side of things, it completely understandable why you'd get irate at one of the biggest stars in music, let alone culture, right? Deciding to basically name drop you in a bar in one of the most hotly anticipated albums of this year because you know it dropped just before the end of the year definitely for me album of the year contender and everyone's listening to it at the same time and then you've got everybody repeating this bar and basically put into question a very traumatic event that you had happened to that you're still trying to deal with i can understand why you respond the way that she did on twitter and she absolutely went crazy um she started off going the first tweet i know i'm very popular but y'all gotta stop um attaching weak ass conspiracy theories in bars to my name niggas no hoes ever address me or at me with a fact or receipt i'm a clout bitch keep sucking my pussy which is weird because you know you can't say drake's trying to get clout off you and he's the biggest artist out but you know whatever another one says he said stallion though so technically he did say your name and she said a stallion is slang for a tall thick woman so she was coping a bit there hoping he wasn't saying anything about her then i guess she got word from her camp that it was about her and came back with this one stop using my shooting for clout bitch ass niggas since when the fuck is it called to joke about women getting shot you niggas especially rap niggas are lame ready to boycott about shoes and clothes but dog power on a black woman when she say one of y'all homeboys abuse her 
So clearly she's doubling down and she's not letting it go, not letting it slide. You know, in her head, Tory Lanez did shoot her and she's going to ride it until the cows come home. And then she iterated it again and said, when the motherfucking facts come out, remember who your ho all your ho asked for favorite rappers that stood behind a nigga that shot a female. Another one says, people attack me all attack me or y'all go for it i defend myself now i'm doing too much every time it never ends and this don't happen until i came out and i said i got shot y'all don't fuck with me okay cool fuck it bye so clearly she's pissed off about the resentment and you know reception she's getting people online clearly for me i don't think it's that big of a deal I feel like people should be allowed to joke and kill on it. But of course, if you're on her side of things and if, if it is as traumatic as she's describing it to be and she believes it happened to where it did happen in a, in, a, in her from her account, then of course you're going to be upset and pissed off about it. So I can get it from that regard. But I felt like her coming out and responding that like this was lame. I thought little Yeti coming out and basically talking for Drake was lame also. Um, I feel like just let just let art live. However people interpret it, they interpret it. But the explanations and the clearing and clarification don't get me wrong it didn't come from drake itself but i feel like all that stuff is absolutely lame not a fan of it in the slightest so let's move on from that one but the one i went to end with when it comes to this whole entire thing especially as a dude can we spare a thought for a minute for flipping parlors and fontaine right um ghost writer to the stars most notably megan sorry most notably cardi b and maybe megan Sally, who knows but obviously a um you know in a relationship with Megan Thee Stallion at the moment. Can we spare a thought for this guy? He's having to sit by and essentially see the entire rap community confess out loud without saying, and some of them saying explicitly, that they've smashed his girl. And I don't know if they smashed her when they were together because there's accounts of the Tory thing. I don't know if the pilot was around during the Tory thing. Who knows? There's the flipping the baby situation where he said in the bar or that he smashed a flipping Megan Thee Stallion also. And it looks like they were both maybe double teaming her at the same time. Or maybe they didn't know that each other was smashing. Then part of some Fontaine thing. Then there's this Drake thing happening in the moment. Is Drake saying what he's saying because he smashed also? Is she reacting the way that she's reacting because he did smash? Like, who knows what's going on? But essentially what we're getting the idea of, it doesn't matter. It's no one's, you know, no one's shaming her for sleeping with men. If you're single, do what you want to do. But as a dude, it's got to be hard to take, especially if you're finding out for the first time in the media. It's maybe one thing if she tells you, which she doesn't have any right to, she, you don't have any right to know if she wants to maybe tell you in terms of how you maybe conduct yourself and act in certain places might be useful because you might be there you know spudding and going over the top with the love and the big bros at some celebrity basketball match not knowing all along that this guy was flipping you know going to town on your missus a couple of months ago you don't want that so maybe it's beneficial she'd just sit you down and say hey here's the guys I've been with categorically, here's the guys I haven't been with, if you hear these rumors, don't believe this, this is true. That might be handy, but if you're finding out for a real time in front of everybody, it's hard to take. And this Instagram post, I think from him, is a clear sign of cope. Um, I guess they're at some Halloween party, and I guess after all that stuff that happened with Tori, after stuff that happened with flipping the baby, the stuff that happened with Drake, with the, with the bar and flipping back outside boys, he then writes in the caption of him taking a picture with them two at a Halloween party, been you i had one a bad one a make a niggas mad one which is funny because you know you would assume he'd get violent and start to fight people because you know that's the thing that he's done beforehand when people have spoken ill of his woman but clearly when this drake getting involved you can't bring that kind of energy you don't want to get um you don't want to get put your hands on like drum did bless him as well he kind of caught strays in this whole flipping debacle but i don't know man spare for for partisan fontaine it's not easy being in a relationship with somebody that hot or that desirable that's usually the problem that people don't talk about often enough i guess it happens on both sides especially for women if you're with a if you're with a guy that's high value or somebody that's incredibly attractive or the other especially attractive forget the value forget the flipping money side of things and status just somebody other girls think is hot it must be difficult to flip in live day by day with that you know what I mean? Because people get really disrespectful very easily, especially on social, outside in general. So imagine for this guy being in a relationship with Megan Thee Stallion, somebody a lot of people had a lot of love for, especially when, you know, pre-shooting and she was the hot girl summer thing, the twerking, like she was the one that everyone kind of had their eyes on. So clearly some people got the opportunity to get a bit closer than eyes. <laughs> and you have to kind of just hold it down at home 
bloody hell, man. Absolutely brutal. But, you know, big up both of them. The album itself, her loss, like I said, absolute classic. Um, love what to say about that in general. An absolute classic. And I can't wait to listen to it again when I go to a, for a run and outside again. Absolute bona fide classic. And then, what do you want to talk about here? Duh, 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 duh. Boom, boom, boom. What time is it? Oh, it's at one for one hour forty forty three. I might have to end there actually. That might be a good place to end it there. Uh, yeah, maybe end it there. That might be a good place to end it actually. So thank you so much again for tuning into the Action Zing Show episode number six one seven. Been a pleasure to have your company as per usual. If it's your first time tuning into my show, you know what to do: smash like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. I'll be grateful to hear all of them. And of course, if you're listening via the podcast app, please share, please leave me a five star review. That'd be also greatly appreciated. And I'll see you guys again on the other side of things, on the other other side of things. But thanks again for tuning into the Action Zing Show episode number six one seven. Listen to the audio app of it. You'll hear hear my song of the day if you're watching via youtube you won't hear anything or go fade to black peace